Hey everyone, welcome to Minecraft Farmcraft. <laughs> Look at this group of people. We have a full house today. Oh, oh, oh there you go. Like for the win with the chicken. <laughs> <laughs> it only took three or four streams to and make it happen. Then, right, exactly. We've got all kinds of critters happening here today. If you don't know what we're talking about, you're going to have to go back and watch the VOD of the first live stream i believe when we started obsessing over could we actually get a chicken on a farmcraft live stream but i am way down the path to the side already and we haven't even said who we are yet so welcome this is nasa the north america scholastic esports federation and this is our live stream with a whole host of guests um, i'm claire lebeau the director of communications and um, i'm going to go ahead we can just do a round robin really quick and introduce ourselves uh, so, Eric, why don't you go next? Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, my name is Eric Leitner. I am a STEM and computer science instructional facilitator for Broward <laughs> County Public Schools. Uh, and I am part of, I guess, all things Minecraft here with NACEF uh, and happy to be part of all things, especially this one. This one is my my uh, favorite because I get to work with some of my favorite people, which you see on the screen before you. Uh, which means I have to kind of randomly pick someone to hand it off to, although that's not true because I'm always and forever going to hand it off to Kathy. So Kathy, say hi. <laughs> hi, everyone. My name is Kathy Chow Isaacs, and I'm thrilled to be here for the Farmcraft live stream. Uh, so what am I? I'm a Minecraft global mentor, and I'm part of the fantastic uh, Minecraft challenge team with ISAP and yay, it's Wednesday, so we are live. We have a great team. I'm the middle. You're a ventriloquist. You are a ventriloquist. You're in the middle, but you're also frozen, and you, you know how to throw your voice. Right. You're well, so good. <laughs> I'm so good. I should be on that uh, America's Got Talent. So right. um, I don't know. Do, which way should I pass it? Should I pass it to the mayor? Yes. Let's go for the mayor. We don't want the mayor. Right definitely. Now. <laughs> yes. Order in, in the session here. Okay. Hey guys, I'm clever like uh, Brian. I am. Uh, I get the pleasure of making, playing video games and telling people I'm busy working all day. So I, I uh, basically, we, my company makes um, educational, really entertaining and engaging educational content inside your favorite video games. And we're the makers of the farm craft world that you'll be playing. And Brian, I want to, I, I want to throw out there real quick. If they follow you on Twitter, they may have gotten a tiny sneak peek today of something that looks really, really cool. That's going to be in the Farmcraft 2.0 world. Right, let me get on the oh. Yeah, oh. I always do this towards the end. I'm like, I'm not liking this. We're gonna do throw a whole new thing in there, and then we now we have. I saw that, and I was like, all right, now I'm now I'm hyped. <gasps> yeah, I, mean, I was already, but hype. Yeah, they work so cool, so cool. Um, I'm very excited about it. I would like to pass it along to uh, our awesome uh, partner in um, marketing in the American spaces, Lynn Scheib, Renard Rue. Thank you, Brian. I am Renard Rue, also known as Lynn Scheib, the partnerships coordinator um, from the Office of American Spaces in the State Department's Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs. And we have more than 600 locations around the world where I hope many folks are and um, have signed up for, it's not too late, sign up for my Farmcraft 2022 if you haven't already. And I'm also thrilled to be a part of this, uh, this wonderful team here. And I'm going to throw the baton over to my colleague, Dr. Adam Ant. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much, Lynn. My, uh, my, my screen name is Dr. Adamant, but I see how we could think about it differently. Um, so I also work at the U.S. Department of State. I'm in the Office of Agricultural Policy as the Biotechnology Advisor, and it's my absolute joy to be coming along every two weeks to a live stream with this great group and tell you more about Farmcraft. And Lynn's right. We, there, there's still plenty of time to sign up. I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, it's until April 16th. So even after we've officially launched in two weeks, you'll be able to continue to uh, register and join up for the competition. Um, I think I'll pass it on over to Gerald so he can tee up our final guest. Greetings, everyone. And I am always in awe when I get on this live channel with all of you because you're the ones who make all of this happen. I'm Gerald Solomon. I'm the founder and executive director of NACEF, North America Scholastic Esports Federation. And what you're going to experience today 
is what everyone here will share, which is the connection of really play and learning, gaining skills and giving yourselves opportunities to have fun while doing that. Um, so Adam, I'll ask you if you could to introduce our special guest of honor. Oh, I mean, sure. I, um, he'll be able to do a much better job than I will. Um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Michelle Cavigelli. I'm sure I said the name completely wrong, but uh, he is an expert from USDA, and he's going to be talking to us today about biodiversity and sustainability. Michelle? Hi, everybody. Great to be here. As uh, at Dr. Adam Ant, or Adam Ant said, I'm Michelle Cavigelli. I work for the U.S. Department of Agriculture, another agency, of course, of the U.S. government. And I'm a soil scientist in Beltsville, Maryland. I love that. Soil scientist. It's so <laughs> you know, exciting. So often I would talk to students and they'd be like, is there a scientist for, and then just a blank space? And the answer was 99% of the time was yes, there absolutely <laughs> is. <laughs> Definitely. I don't hear what the 1% is. <laughs> I'm curious to know. Um, but yeah, I don't know if that technically, like, I don't know, you know what I would say, like, for like, you know, we're talking about gamers and I would have students who'd be like, are there scientists who specifically study Rocket League or Minecraft? And I want to say no, but there probably are. Mm -hmm. So maybe 99.9 .9 repeating percent would be more accurate, mm -hmm. but yeah. Right. They're called physicists. They are. Well, yeah, very much for, uh, for Rocket League. Rocket League. Right. <laughs> um, so yeah, we're extremely happy that you're here as our guest today. We're going to have a ton of questions for you, as always, because it's what we love to do. Um, before we start, though, we do want to take a look at some submissions from our second uh, preseason challenge, uh, which was all about climate change. We had uh, an incredible amount, uh, you know, a wonderful uh, assortment of entries, some really incredible ones. We want to share a few today. Uh, before I do, though, uh, we're going to pull up the screen and so you can see just how hard our job is sometimes, how hard you've all made our job in the best possible way. Um, and we could pull the map up on the screen there. Claire. I'm working on it. Sorry. There we go. This is where our teams are. And this is where we get submissions from. Everywhere you see that little NACEF logo, there's at least one or m many teams from those nations that are pinned with those logos. Uh, I think we're up to 54 or 55 nations that are participating. Uh, so it's incredible the amount of entries we get. It's incredible um, the work that we see come from all these places. And it makes it really hard uh, to determine what we're going to share on stream. So we always think about, okay, what was the challenge? What voices do we want to elevate? Who haven't we spotlighted yet? Things like that. Uh, you know, and we try to spotlight as many as we can, but we don't have as that many of these streams or that much time without delivering all the information that we wanted to. But I wanted to share that map. This map is now on the NACEF website on the Farbcraft uh, page. Uh, so you can check out that map yourselves and see where all of the other countries and nations that you're participating with are. So that's that can be a fun exercise in seeing just who's doing this with you. And on that note, we want to jump into some of the entries from some of those pins in the map. So we're going to take a look at our first entry. Uh, and again, a uh, reminder that the goal here was to talk about uh, how climate change is affecting farmers and how farmers are adapting to climate change. Uh, and the challenge was to build a world that talked about some of those and what your solutions to some of those issues may be. So we're going to start with Team Crypto Farmers uh, from France. And this is actually, I think, one of the first times we've shared um, I think we've shared an entry on, on one of our live streams from uh, mainland Europe. So we've got quite a few European teams this year. We're very excited to have all of you. So let's play uh, the video from Team Crypto Farmers from France. When, what a uh -oh. Then we're going to present you the way we fight against climate change as farmers. For those who don't know, climate change is a change in global cl climate pattern. And uh, currently, it's a global warming. 25% of uh, the CO2 emissions come from uh, the agriculture. That's why farmers um, play a major role in the fight against climate change. Um, they have ways to, miti to mitigate their impacts and uh, they have to uh, adapt their cultures. So as farmers we have to uh, improve our energy efficiency. We use um, lunar and solar energy um, to get electricity uh, for uh, the lights of uh, the farm. We also use uh, wind energy uh, to make uh, the, 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 the mill work. 
and finally the muscular energy with our tongue here. We also have to improve our water consumption. Uh, we have a big lake where uh, we take water from to um, nourish the crops. Um, to um, to water the the greenhouses, we have um, a, a channel in here, and for the domestic use, we've got a supply of water in here. It uses the water from the rain, and we've got a lot of trees uh, from a forest uh, to make all our uh, buildings. This forest is uh, sustainably managed which means that uh, we plant a tree every time we cut a tree. To face climate change, we have um, diverse ways to, pro to process. Um, the first one is that uh, we have many kinds of uh, plants. We've got um, wheat, pumpkins, beetroots, carrots, potatoes, and uh, in the greenhouses, watermelons. We don't use pesticides because we have an efficient compost system, as uh, you can see in every greenhouse. The sand beach is a natural filter for uh, the water coming to our crops. As you can see, we don't use machines with uh, the animals, especially the cows. Uh, we milk them uh, ourselves. So that's how we fight um, against climate change. Layla! All right. <laughs> Did you see the name of the NPC? Yeah. <laughs> you may have a connection to that one, right? A little bit. <laughs> well, I don't uh, know. Yeah, so <laughs> that was great. There was, there was a lot to take in in that one. Um, and, and they made a lot of really clear points. So they talked about uh, where they were getting their energy from, uh, how are they were utilizing and managing their water supply, uh, which crops they were growing, uh, which crops they were using uh, greenhouses for, uh, they were composting. So we saw a lot of those strategies. And actually, since we have a soil expert with us, um, that is something I don't think we've actually discussed on any of ours is, um, is composting and how those strategies can be used or how they affect uh, climate change or how they can be used to mitigate the effects uh, or manage the effects of climate change. Um, so they made that point. Is there is there a connection? There? Sure. Um, of course, you can put your plant residues and things like that back into the soil directly, which is not necessarily composting, but the same processes happen with decomposition. But most people who are not farmers uh, eat food, everyone that I've met so far, and when we eat food, we have banana peels and we have coffee grinds and everything else like that. Most people put that in the trash, which is a bad, bad, bad idea because that creates methane. But if you have a compost bin, either in your backyard or a communal one, then you reduce methane big time and you produce a compost that's usable instead of throwing organic waste into the trash, which is not recommended. But that, I think that's a way you can have a big impact on... Uh, uh, even as non-farmers, you know, everybody could. So. Interesting. Yeah, I, I didn't realize the level of the impact there. And as soon as they had brought up composting, I kind of, my brain said, oh, well, that's something, you know, we would do to enrich our soil or even to generate, you know, nutrients for soil. Um, and I was curious what kind of positive or negative impact that may have. So uh, I'm glad they put it in there because it's uh, something we haven't brought up yet. So I love this. This happens all the time that the students say something and we go, wait, Either A, I didn't know you could do that in Minecraft, or B, they bring up a talking point that we hadn't even considered yet. So, yeah. but, so um, I, I have to jump. I have to jump in. Um, yeah. What's happening in uh, composting that's not creating methane? Like, if you were to throw it in the trash. Yeah. So if you throw something in the trash, you know, basically, then it ends up in a dump, and you end up with conditions that tend to be wet and. Uh, conducive to the types of microorganisms that produce methane. And often at a dump site, you'll even see that they that they have pipes in there to get rid of the methane, to, and sometimes they burn it off. And if you burn methane, it turns into CO2, which is actually a good thing because the methane is about 25 times as powerful as CO2 as a greenhouse gas. 
So methane is actually worse than CO2. We talk about CO2 a lot because it's the most important one, but methane is 25 times as, as important as as effective as a greenhouse gas. And it also has a shorter half-life, which means that if we take care of methane, methane is really kind of the lowest hanging fruit for climate change. And then the third greenhouse gas is nitrous oxide and agriculture is the primary source of that. Uh, and it's also an important source of methane with, with cow burps and stuff like that. So it gets complicated, but um, if you, let me come back to the original question though, when you're producing methane in a landfill, that's because you don't have the right conditions to produce CO2 instead of methane during the decomposition process. But if you do it in a well-managed compost pile, you keep it well enough aerated, but wet enough so that you have microbial activity and that turns all the carbon molecules that are in a banana peel or coffee grounds into CO2 instead of methane. So each molecule of CO2, well, each molecule of methane is 25 times as powerful of, as a molecule of CO2. So if you can go to CO2 instead of methane, you're actually doing a good thing, even though you are producing CO2. So it might be a little bit counterintuitive. Yeah. Hopefully that made sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think you uh, you you hit on things that that Adam is passionate about because I see him nodding and even like a big smile as soon as you started talking about microbes, his face sort of lit up a little bit there. So I know. Man, I'm I'm waiting to use my big muscle word here. That's right. I, I almost used the word enzyme, but I was afraid to Ooh, see what. Ooh, that's <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. I won my middle school science fair. What, what's your big muscle word enzymes, there? So. Like uh, facultative anaerobes. <laughs> wow, that is a muscle word. Yeah, I learn so much every time here. Yeah, we, we all learn from this program, regardless of which side of the camera we're on. So, yeah, you know, it's like it, bacteria that will produce nitrous oxide if you overwater your farm. Do you have that like on a post-it terrible. note next to your monitor? It's, or? it's permanently <laughs> ingrained. It's like the immersion. <laughs> That's what happens when you play these games and learn this thing firsthand. It's like it becomes real. It, I agree completely. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's definitely point. one of those takeaways. And honestly, I think Adam getting like really excited when we had that conversation uh, is one of the things that made it stick, right? Like, oh, if somebody is this passionate about it, it has to be something mm -hmm. worth knowing. So it's wild. Yeah. Perfect. All right. So uh, we do want to share at least one more video. We'll see how time allows here in our in our warm up here. Uh, but we want to share a video from Team Like One from Portugal. So we're staying in a similar area of the map. Uh, but let's take a look at the entry from Team Like One from Portugal. I do want to note the volume on the entry was a little low. So we'll try to stay quiet. And if you need to turn up your volume on the other end of the stream, uh, that may help you hear it. Hi, everyone. My name is David, and I'm here to represent the team with Team Like One. And we're going to show you our map about the President's challenge number two about climate change. Here we have Gina. Uh, the main driver around climate change is, is the greenhouse effect. Some gases in the Earth uh, atmosphere act a, a bit like this glass in a greenhouse, trapping the sun's heat and stopping it from leaking back into space and causing a global warming. Uh, we decided to build three greenhouses to demonstrate that they contribute to climate change despite their healthy appearance regarding the glass uh, uh, that surrounds them and the care that human beings have for the plantation. All this is a, an illusion and greenhouses have a negative impact in our atmosphere uh, by accumulating gases such as CO2 and methane. We have Edit, we will talk about our power station. Here is located the power station, which is important to recognize that remote, um, renewable energies have to be given more and more priority. Therefore, all power stations are important as they are able to transform the cinetic energy coming from the force of the water uh, from the dam or the force of the wind and transform it into electrical energy. There we have the wind power coming from our wind and here uh, there we have we have the dam right there. If you have our mechanism to open it, we have the, the top open system over here. In fact, it's just over here. Right now, it is uh, it is while open, but when I enter in the chunks close to it, it will close it, as uh, you can see. And right here, we have also another system um, alongside the dam, which is the... Um, uh, seismograph. 
uh, there is a mechanism used to measure the scales of earthquakes. Earthquakes are also linked to climate change. Once in Portugal we had a, a very huge uh, earthquake, it was 200 years ago at Lisbon, at the, our capital. Here, uh, Alice uh, will talk about the mill, it's also an excellent mechanism to produce indoor energy, especially the energy from the wind power. And to finalize, we have the beekeeper John. Uh, the, the development cycle of the bees is influenced by climate change and each bee race has its own pace of development. Um, so any change in climate or movement of a bee race from one ge geography region to another has a significant uh, consequences. Uh, we decide to do a beekeeping to demonstrate that bees are animals easily shaken by in, uh, climatic changes and are essential, essentially uh, for our world. And this is our map for season 2, we have the, our electrical energy that give it uh, to our village with uh, also a solar panel in it. Well, this is our map, I hope you like it guys, see you soon. Yeah, we hope everyone was able to hear, uh, I know we could hear pretty much on our hand everything that they were coming across and there was a lot of information again. Um, I loved that they made connections to sort of what was happening locally, um, you know, specifically in their country of Portugal um, and in the capital, uh, again, historically as well. Um, also, they made a connection to the impacts of climate change on uh, wildlife uh, and the wildlife that are directly linked to farming, like the bee populations. Um, thought that was really great. Um, so I don't know if anyone's got any takeaways from that one that they'd like to share or questions that came up as a result of the things uh, that they were discussing. The connection between earthquakes and climate change was something that I haven't really thought about. I live in California and we have lots of earthquakes where I am and a lot of noticeable change in our climate as well that's, you know, leading to things like the fires. And so that's an interesting concept. Yeah. And I'm sure Kathy loved the windmills in there. <laughs> <laughs> Always and forever, yeah, right. It, yes. uh, they did I love make the it. windmills too, and that the all parts of the community were involved, um, mm -hmm. as well as the historical connection. I thought was really, um, really a fine contribution. Mm -hmm. Way to go, Portugal! Yeah. yeah, one of the things that I really loved that it was in there because it sparks these kind of conversations, and I've had these conversations with students as we talk about things like hydroelectric power, right? And most of our hydroelectric power is a result of very large dams. Um, and while it is a clean, quote unquote, source of energy when compared to uh, burning fossil fuels, let's say, as an example, um, there's still an environmental impact of creating a dam and blocking the flow, natural mm -hmm. flow of water uh, in an ecosystem or an environment uh, or in a specific biome for a specific species. Um, and so, again, you know, having those debates and, and that's a conversation I think is really worth having is how important it is to simply debate these topics in a healthy way. Um, amongst students, right? And that's one of the things we're sort of hoping comes of this is that these spark some debate. How do we, how do we find the the give and take of any of these uh, uh, procedures, policies, uh, methods that we utilize uh, to determine, you know, impact versus reward sort of thing? Uh, and that was one that always came up was with hydroelectric power. Eric, you mentioned hoping that students will debate these things. And I'm just going to throw out into the mix here that we did just launch a Discord channel just for Farmcraft. And so that's something where potentially we could see students from France and Portugal communicating with each other in that Discord channel and sharing ideas. So I'm going to go ahead and head over to that channel and grab a link and I will drop it in the chat. But we would love to see these conversations now start to take shape in Discord among the participants who are from all different countries. Absolutely. So I think at this point, we are ready to jump into our Minecraft world. So Gerald, this is usually where we thank you for coming. And you're like, all right, go do your Minecraft thing. Uh, <laughs> I will perfect. be in chat. So I will talk to everyone through there. Thank you, everyone, for being part of this. Thank Great. you, as always, for Thank making you for bringing happen. us together. Yeah. All right, here we go. Thanks, Gerald. Oh, oops, my bad. I apologize. Well, if we have time, we'll, we'll jump. I have so many part. videos. So many I know. things lined up here. Should be the very oh, first. Oh, here I am. Here I am. Okay. There we go. All right, so we are we are back in our Minecraft world that we have been kind of 
very slowly and awkwardly building while trying to have conversations and ask questions and have dialogue at the same time, uh, which is really my favorite part of this. But uh, we're really happy that our, our uh, guest, Michelle, is joining us in the world, although I have no idea where you are right now. Like looking around for you, you did you wander off on us? I did wander off. I was looking over some big lake somewhere. Oh, okay. You know what though? <laughs> I'm gonna have to use my my Minecraft powers mm -mm. and bring okay. you back. Um, oh, Michelle. The rescue helicopter. Uh, there, yep. I, oh no, I see clever lake. I can try to walk rainbow, my hang on. We're gonna bring you back. Oh, is that me up in the air there? <laughs> there. I, I, I brought you. I brought you back. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> I have that that sort of godlike power in this world. Uh, but but we uh, what we want to talk about today, very specifically, and our, our focus topic uh, for all of this when we talk about our challenge for the next one is uh, on uh, very specifically sustainability uh, and our impact on uh, ecosystems, um, big or small. So. Um, Obviously, as a soil expert, I assume you're not just looking at the things that are, make up the soil, but all the, also the things that are living in it, right? And the, and the impact that those have on what is happening. Correct. Yeah. Uh, soil is very complex. It is probably the, it's less understood than some parts of the moon, some people think. And that is because it is, you, you can't see in it, right? You have to, if you can dig a hole, you can look in it, but then you're only looking at a small part of it. And within every uh, 30 grams of soil, for example, there's 10 million different species of bacteria, fungi, nematode, mites. And we're just beginning to get a sense of what all those organisms are doing. Um, I'll kind of leave it at that, I think, unless you want me to go on about something. Well, where I, where how, I was... how big was the volume of soil? Yeah, well, there's like, kind of one famous paper that came out when I was in graduate school. It was 30 grams of soil. So it's like a handful of soil. A handful 30 of soil. grams. Yeah. Can you imagine our so next there's map? There's literally a whole ecosystem in your hand when you grab that <laughs> handful of soil. Yeah. We're all picturing it. <laughs> yeah, right? oh, absolutely. And, 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 and we can identify some of those, but mostly we can't identify most of those, but we can track them nowadays with DNA and we can say this organism is different from that one but we don't really know what many of them do. We know what we know what many things that we know many things that happen in the soil, but we can't always say this specific organism is doing that specific thing. You know, like above the ground, you can say that tree is shading that house, for example, right? That's easy. Uh, or you can, you, we know that a tree does photosynthesis and takes in CO2 from the atmosphere. Uh, but whether an organism does photosynthesis or not, it's hard to tell, uh, but there's lots of other processes. So it's, it's very complicated. It's really um, kind of the edge of our knowledge. Well, and, so, so Michelle, that brings want, me. Oh, I'm sorry, Eric, just very quickly. I just want to make sure that we're very clear. What you said, Michelle, is that there's tens of millions of species of these different organisms there. It's not saying that there's 10 million organisms, 10 million species, yeah, right? Um, let me actually back up. 10,000, I said the wrong word. 10,000 oh, 10, species in that Oh, well, that's nothing species. at all then. Yeah, that's nothing at all. <laughs> and then how one many of each, each of those of species each, right? though, right? Yeah, yeah. No, the, the number of organisms is much higher, obviously. I cannot remember that number. Again, that was back in graduate school days, but it, you know, there's billions and billions of organisms in, in a field of soil. There's, so there's 10,000 species of birds in the whole wide world, and in a handful of soil, you have the same number of, of microorganisms. So that kind of puts a little bit in context, maybe. You mentioned graduate school, and I want to back up kind of the question because, you know, obviously telling us there are 10,000 organisms in a handful or, or types of organisms, species of organisms in a handful of soil uh, is interesting enough for me to want to learn more. <laughs> uh, but... Like, how does this, how do you get to this point where you say, like, I, I am an expert on soil, I study soil, how did this, like, how did this become the thing? Like, even before school, how did this become the, the passion? You yeah. say, don't interrupt me, I'm counting. <laughs> One, two, three. Like, why does everybody keep interrupting me? I'm counting all these organisms. 999. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, good question. So, I think part of it is that my parents grew up on farms in Switzerland. And so I, I grew up in the United States, but we would visit there periodically. So I always had positive experiences on farms. 
and affiliated that with family. And then when I was in high school, I was into my mother was a gardener, and so I spent time gardening. So I got I had a feel for what soil is. You know, it wasn't kind of foreign to me, but I still had no idea that a there was such thing as a soil scientist, or b that I would become one of those. Um, but when I went to college, I was a biology major, and I really wanted to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. And I realized that I really wanted to address environmental issues of one kind or another. And I looked around and realized that the one of the biggest sources of environmental challenges is agriculture itself. And based on that, I essentially ended up going to graduate school to try to better understand how we can improve agriculture to reduce essentially nutrient losses. So, you know, in agriculture, we put nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, other nutrients in the soil to make up for the stuff we harvest and bring somewhere else. But managing those nutrients is not that easy and it's complicated. And at the time I was in graduate school, the big issues were nitrate leaching into groundwater, phosphorus uh, running off the surface of soils and uh, causing eutrophication of surface waters. And at that time, climate change and agriculture were not closely related. But by the time I got to my PhD, I ended up studying nitrous oxide, the bacteria that produce nitrous oxide. And because uh, that's one of the three greenhouse gases in agriculture is the uh, primary source of nitrous oxide. So it kind of went from there. And by the way, nitrous oxide is produced by uh, bacteria that are facultative anaerobes. Oh, there you go. We get it we've twice come, in we've one come stream. full circle. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That fast too. We didn't have to wait till later in the stream. <laughs> These are like little bacteria with this uh like, you know, with this backup plan. You know, like they're breathing uh the breathing air, right? And then when they get suffocated, they start breathing other things like nitrogen uh, and yep. and yeah, yeah, very well, yeah, really well put. They, yeah, specifically the well, there's different kinds, right? But the ones that produce NTO specifically use nitrate, nitrate or nitrite, which now, is where you get the nit nitrous oxide. Yeah. Now, now, Michelle, looking at our farm that we have here, would we be a good candidate for accidentally producing nitrous oxide, or do you think we've done a good job in making sure that uh, our soil biodiversity is? high or that we've we're using water appropriately what, what are your thoughts yeah it's it's a little challenge so nitrous oxide is produced when you have the perfect conditions and the perfect conditions as are that you have carbon in the soil so soil organic matter is a source of carbon so you almost always have that but it's also produced when levels of nitrate are high and when the soil is wet so you have to have those three things, and then you can get these bursts of nitrous oxide that might last a day or two or up to a week, and then it comes back down to baseline. So those conditions happen beyond our control to some extent, right? Because if you're not irrigated, and most farms are not irrigated, then you're just depending on rainfall. And if it rains a lot, your soil is going to get wet. You can't do anything about it. So the primary thing we can manage then is the amount of nitrogen in the soil. And the amount of nitrogen in the soil then is controlled by how much you put on and where you put it and what kind you put and when you put it on. Mm -hmm. So those kind of four things. And the best way to minimize, you can't eliminate N2O emissions. You're always gonna get some, but you can you know, reduce it by a hundred fold possibly. There's nitrous oxides coming out of unmanaged forest, for example, but at very, very low levels. So you always get a little bit, but then in agriculture, uh, managing that nitrogen, whether it's fertilizers or animal manures or any other source of nitrogen is the critical thing to do. We know how to do some of that, but we don't always know how to do, do it in all conditions, given that weather is a big factor right and then your soil type is going to be a big factor if you have a sandy soil and it rains a lot your sandy soil is going to drain pretty fast so you're not going to have those anaerobic hot spots as they're called where n2o can be produced nearly as long as you would in a soil that doesn't drain as well so mm -hmm. you have to factor all those things in yeah. so, so then, sandy soil could actually be useful sorry kathy go oh no uh, well you know i'm playing and looking up things at the same time so 
I want to just say, so nitrous oxide is not funny. No, it's not at all funny. <laughs> like, <that's the> <laughs> okay, okay, so then that, that's one thing that I want to say. And then the other is, so then it, it also depends on the kind of fertilizer you use, right? That's what I'm seeing from. And yeah, the, it does, right? but that's a pretty complex story. Um, we can't really generalize too much on that. But the, the biggest thing is application rate of the nitrogen and also the timing. The ideal thing would be if you could kind of spoon feed your crop. Not, often people put the nitrogen in the soil at the same time they plant something. Let's use corn because that's what I know most about. And corn is the biggest user of nitrogen on the planet. So if we use corn, you plant it. If you put nitrogen down at the same time you plant it, that corn is not going to be doing anything with that nitrogen until about a month after it's grown and it's about a foot tall. Before that, it just can't take it up very fast. So one of the primary ways to reduce, to increase nitrogen use efficiency, and by doing that, reducing N2O and other nitrogen losses, is instead of putting a lot of nitrogen when you plant the corn, you only put a little bit, and then after about 30 days, you do what's called side dressing. And that's basically applying the bulk of your nitrogen right at the time where the plant is getting big enough to be able to take up a bunch of it. And so that you're increasing the synchrony between the timing of your application of nitrogen and when the corn takes it up. And so, you'll probably be shocked to find out that there is no corn by default in Minecraft. This is <laughs> this is something that I think every time we've mentioned this with, with anyone who's done any work in farming in Minecraft, they go, what do you mean there's no corn in Minecraft? Maybe we, have we all need these to other make crops, a feature no request. Corn. That's right. Well, you do have wheat, right? And we do have wheat. I think yeah. that's the second most uh, nitrogen, the, the crop with, to which nitrogen is second most applied. Rice is second or third, and wheat is second or third. I can't remember the order. Uh, but those are the three biggies on a global basis. And they're all high nitrogen demanding crops, meaning that they'll perform well if they have a lot of nitrogen. But the key is to try to give them the nitrogen when they need it. So you had also mentioned soil type, uh, and that's something that we can kind of discuss within Minecraft and why I've been kind of creating this little patch of soil in front of us, as well as some sandy patches and things like that. There are not a lot of soil types by default in Minecraft, right? We've got dirt, we've got tilled farmland, and then within that tilled farmland, there are various levels of moisture ranging from the dark, which is, you know, saturated, if you will, to kind of lighter colors, which is a little bit more dry. Uh, and then we've got sand block, right, which is, you know, extraordinarily sandy. And Brian, Kathy, am I leaving any soil types out here? Because <laughs> there aren't a lot. But... There's like yeah. mycelium, um, but I, I don't know. It works. Yeah, which which has a function for growth, I guess, of mm -hmm. mushrooms and things like that. Right. But yeah. Um, but um, when, when we talk about soil types in the real world, right? So if I were to count those, I can count those on one hand, basically, in the game. And it's pretty straightforward what grows in each of them, right? Like, okay, so I've got sandy block. I can put a, I can grow cactus there. Uh, if I've got, you know, moist soil uh, and a good water supply, I can grow things like wheat, for example. Um, it, it's pretty straightforward for the most part. There are some exceptions. For example, things like sugarcane have to be very close to a water source. So you can plant them a block farther away than a water source, but it's, there's not many exceptions to all of this. So when we say soil types uh, in the real world, how, how many soil types are we talking about? Uh, probably more than bird species. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, there's different ways of looking at that. One way is kind of a first cut is that there are 10 soil orders in the world. There's a whole topic. There's a whole field called uh, soil taxonomy, you know, in the same way that birds or organisms are tax are put into groups so the 10 soil orders include things like um uh so the the, the kind of the the best type for uh for growing most many crops is called a mollusol and that is a type of a, a soil type that used to be a grassland and the united states ukraine australia france have big areas of mollusols, which is why they have really good agricultural lands. Those are really the best ag lands, you know, like Iowa was largely mollusols. Uh, Ukraine is a big place for mollusols, which is 
uh, as a complete side comment, is part of the reason that people are interested in Ukraine and have been for many years. So soils have a big impact on geopolitics, actually, as a side note. Uh, but So there's those 10 orders. And then kind of at the other extreme is an oxisol, which is a, as the name might imply, oxy means it's been oxidated a lot. So it doesn't have very many nutrients. And those tend to be found more in the tropics. And then you have a bunch of things in between, like alpha sols that are grow under forests. You have entosols, which are very young soils. So it really varies kind of at this kind of big scale. And then within all of those, another way to look at different soil types, which we kind of talked a little bit about when you mentioned Sandy, is that there's 11 textural classes. And there's a thing called a soil textural triangle. And what this means is that you can have something that's 100% soil, uh, sand, that's kind of one extreme. You can have one that's 100% silt, that's another extreme. And you can have one that's 100% uh, clay. Those are kind of the three extremes. And those things, a sand, the difference between those particles is, low, is pretty much the size. A sand particle is large. Everybody's seen a sand particle, right? And a clay particle is tiny. And silt is in between. The size of the particle has a huge impact on the pop physical, chemical, physical and chemical primarily properties of those particles. So, um, so they, the combination of those three, and you have everything in between too, right? You have thirty-three percent of each of those, where you can have sixty-five percent, ten percent, and whatever the other twenty-five percent. So it's all over the map, and that triangle covers all those different possibilities. But the triangle is not divided into 11 equally sized uh, pieces because clay and sand have big, bigger impacts than the proportion within that triangle. I'm getting to a little bit of the nitty gritty here, but um, those 11 soil textures, they're called, those 11 soil textures have a big impact on how water moves into and out of soil how gases move in and out of soil, how easily plants roots can grow in the soil, how organisms work in the soil. And so there's ways of categorizing that way. For a game like this, you know, you kind of have three categories. You're capturing, it sounds like, kind of the extremes, which is, or the, you know, you, you've caught the range. You know, then you right. could subdivide it into smaller distinctions maybe. If yeah, that makes sense, right? We've got ones that, you know, some crops only grow in one, some crops only grow in the other. And again, one far more effective than the other uh, at the different extremes. So yeah, it makes uh, complete sense. Um, so at least there's some representation in the game of that. And I know that one of the goals uh, from Brian and his team is to kind of make that even more so. So for example, uh, in the season one of Minecraft, we could actually watch the, you know, see a visual representation of the water level kind of effectively changing from very arid to very moist uh, and things like that, which in the game you'll watch if it does dry out, it kind of just blinks from one to the other a little bit more <laughs> hmm. uh, immediately. I'll add, I'll add just one complicating factor just to keep it closer to reality. Uh, the soil, te uh, the texture of a soil varies with depth. And so you can have a very sandy soil at the top, but very clay at the bottom or the other way around. And that affects everything like water and gas movement. So is that a result of density? Uh, no, like layering of it or is it? No, it's a result of what's called soil forming factors. So it depends on some soils are formed because the wind blows a bunch of stuff over there. Some are formed by rivers moving silt around, you know, like in Egypt with the Nile River and and what's be what's at the bottom part is dependent on what's called the parent material which is what the rock is at, way at the bottom so the bottom is dependent on that and the top is dependent more on what happens afterwards so it can vary a lot I try so to think of what's show, going on in our own backyard if, our, if a farmer wants to grow I'm just going to make up something he wants to grow um water melon and his soil isn't good for that but he's got right temperature and all these other things can he go and actually change his soil composition so that's more useful or more uh, works better for watermelons is that something that's possible to do if you have a lot of money 
<laughs> in, in, in one acre of soil, in one acre, there's 2 million pounds of soil. And if you want to change the amount, what, what, so in your situation, Adam, what is most likely is that you have maybe a silty or a clay soil and watermelons like uh, sandier soil. So you could truck in sand and put it in rows and plant your watermelons in that row. And then you'd have 30, 60 inches of a meter of point for the next row. So you wouldn't have to add sand there, but you'd put it just where it's growing. And part of the reason mm -hmm. I know some of this is when I first did some farming on my own, I did it with a guy who actually tucked in uh, sand to do exactly that to grow carrots. Wow. How, mm -hmm. how deep do you have to go? So, so he's just I mean, laying stuff right on top. Soil, how, how much do you? Yeah, we would make we would make a furrow maybe uh, six to twelve inches deep with a with a small tractor, and then put the sand in there, and then cover the sand back up with a little bit of the soil again. So we basically had these little hills. We ended up with a little hill, which was mostly sand. That's the only time I've ever heard of that happening. On a on a commercial scale, it gets very difficult. Mm -hmm. And in fact, that's when you talk about soil quality and soil properties, you talk about properties that are dynamic in other words that can change with management and ones that are not dynamic and soil texture is one of those that's generally considered not dynamic in other words you can't change it right but i just gave you an example where you can but it really, yeah it's really not i mean for very high value crops my guess is people do it and i'm just not familiar with that because if you think about growing stuff in a greenhouse or hydroponics that's a huge investment as well to grow high 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 uh high value crops that can justify kind of that level of infrastructure but for things like wheat it'll never work for instance unless maybe you live in uh united arab emirates or something that has resources to do that because they've you know created islands <laughs> so so how does um crop rotation play into soil health. That's something that some of the students brought up last week was they were planning to rotate their crops. Yeah, very good question. So just to make sure that everybody's on the same page. So crop rotation is where you, one year or one season, you have one crop on a piece of ground, and then the next season or the next year, you just use a different crop on the same piece of ground. And historically, crop rotation was almost required because you, it, crop rotation helps with many things. It helps with uh, soil fertility issues. It helps with disease and insect and weed control. Uh, and those are the two biggies. I'll, I'll stop right there and, and kind of delve into those a little bit. So historically, uh, you know, people didn't, we did not have access to nitrogen fertilizers, but nitrogen is generally the most limiting nutrient. So in Europe, where my family's from, so I know a little bit about the history, uh, they would generally use a crop rotation where they had a legume which is which fixes nitrogen from the atmosphere and you would harvest the legume it could be something like a forage for cows like alfalfa and you would grow that for maybe a couple of years because that's a perennial and then you would kill it and then you would plant potatoes or something that requires a lot of nitrogen and the nitrogen that's left in the alfalfa when you kill it goes into the soil and is decomposed and that's the nitrogen that the potatoes would use so historically crop rotations were critical for those kind of nutrient management issues. And then on top of that, crop rotation is really good for a lot of pests because a number of pests have a life cycle where they go back into the soil and they emerge the next year. In, in part, the part of the world where I live, we have winters. And so a lot of pests overwinter in the soil. Well, if a pest is a pest for one crop, but not another, if you grow the crop that is susceptible to the pest one year but then you go and you build up the population of that pest just because that crop is there the next year if you plant a crop that's not susceptible to that pest then you've solved your problem you know at least for that year depending on how long the life cycle of the pest is so that's actually one of the most important uh uses for crop rotation Ah, so does that impact somehow um and we haven't defined organic yet so I'll ask the question and then maybe you can define organic also, but is that one way that farmers could have organic crops is by rotating them and, and 
using natural methods like that to keep the pests out? Yeah, of course. Right. Yeah. Good question. Because, you know, historically everybody was organic, right? Because organic is largely defined by what it is not. It is partially defined by what it is and what it is, it requires crop rotation is part of the, the requirement, but what it doesn't, uh, the parts that it is not, it doesn't allow you to use synthetic fertilizers or uh, many of the pesticides. And those are uh, for health reasons, you know, for safety reasons is what drives that. Um, and I say, historically, everybody was organic because we hadn't invented a lot of that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So organic was partially a response to the uh, humans inventing those things and seeing some of the the negative effects that were side effects of developing those those tools. And uh, so, yeah, so then what organic is and kind of a more positive perspective is trying to use as much as we know about how natural systems work and managing the nutrient cycles, the pest cycles, et cetera in a way similar to what I've mentioned, you know, for the crop rotation is, is, is using our knowledge of nature to manage things as opposed to chemical tools is kind of one way to think about organic. Mm -hmm. I was so, wondering earlier, you were mentioning applying nitrogen to the soil. And I was thinking, could you do that organically or is that, yep. is that non-organic? So, the synthetic nitrogen that many people use is not allowed in organic, but what people can do is kind of two large options. One is using a legume prior to a crop that requires a lot of corn. So that alfalfa example I gave, mm -hmm. that's a common thing that's done in organic, but uh, not all farmers can or like to use a perennial because like a perennial like alfalfa, humans don't eat that. You have to have a, a cow essentially or, or goats or sheep to eat or, or horses to eat that and if you have alfalfa and you feed it to livestock on your farm you also have another form of nitrogen which is in the manure that those animals produce so then that's the other big form of nitrogen that is used in organic systems is livestock waste the those, those are really important in uh field crops like wheat and corn that doesn't exist in this game and other crops like that, but within the vegetable and fruit industry that are much more high value, uh, within the organic community, people will uh, use things like uh, seaweed or, or, or fish meal based or alfalfa meal based fertilizers, all of which have nitrogen. And the goal there is to use a, not only it's called organic in terms of organic farming, but it's also organic in terms of the organic chemistry. You know, it's an organic molecule as opposed to a mineral or inorganic molecule, which most nitrogen fertilizers are, or are converted into very quickly. So the idea is that by applying organic sources of nitrogen, the release rate of that nitrogen is over a longer time period, and you're hopefully feeding your crop year round or season wide instead of having it all be available very quick. I can't remember right. if I asked your, your original question. Anyway. <laughs> you did, you did. <laughs> I was asking about what was organic or non-organic, and we did discuss so, that. You mentioned how much it would cost for farmers to bring in a, a certain type of soil uh, to effectively grow the crop they want to grow because maybe all those other conditions are right. What if we assume that the soil is already perfect for it? Uh, how do they keep it that way? <laughs> would be oh, that's my question, go. right? You yeah. mentioned like if I got a handful of soil, there's 10,000 species of microbes in there. I assume all of them have some role to play in that micro ecosystem, if you will. Uh, how do you maintain that? How do you not do things that are eventually going to kill a whole lot of those off? Yeah. Um, so every soil has a lot of organisms in it. Even if you beat it up, microorganisms are surprisingly resilient. You'll have some. What you don't, what we don't know is. Um, how functional they are or what they act, what the function might, might have changed. So you always have some, so you can't, there's no such thing as a dead soil, which is kind of an extreme, but there are certainly lots of states of soil between what would be a, considered a healthy soil and a not healthy soil. And in terms of the microbiology, people talk about the ratio of bacteria to fungi as being one way to look at some of that. 
and just looking at the numbers of bacteria as a whole, you know, having more often is considered better, but some of those microorganisms are disease organisms, right? So you obviously don't want more of those, but the vast majority are not. So it gets pretty complicated pretty fast to look at uh, the, the, the biology, but coming back to your original question, if you have a good soil and you don't want it to reduce in quality, some of the things you can do are to keep it covered year round. If you look around at nature, you really don't see bare soil unless you have something like a, a hurricane or a, a tree fall. And even then that soil gets covered up really fast. In agriculture, we often see naked soil, right? And the reason that we have uncovered soil is to try to facilitate growth of the crops that we want. So right now, there's a big movement worldwide, which has kind of taken me by surprise because uh, I did my master's on cover crops in the late 80s. And then uh, about 20 years later, the whole concept of cover crop really started exploding. And I can't, can't take any credit for that because uh, there was a little bit of a gap between when I did my work and when they took off. But um, the concept of a cover crop is planting, a, having a plant. Uh, so in, in my part of the world where we grow summer crops from like April, May to maybe October, if you grow corn or soybeans during that time period, then if you don't plant anything after you harvest the corn or soybeans, then your soil will be there during the winter. And that's about the one of the worst things you can do because during the winter you have uh, you know rain, you have winds, the soil can erode. So the primary thing you want to do is keep that soil where it is, keep the surface soil from going downhill. So a cover crop were designed primarily to keep the soil there over winter by planting a winter crop that just covers the soil, as the name implies. Since then, since the kind of I mean, they've been around for 10,000 years, as long as agriculture has, right? Uh, but their use has gone up and down over the years. If you look in the 1930s in the United States, there's all kinds of publications on cover crops because they were very useful to produce nitrogen, like we talked about earlier. Then with the invention of nitrogen, the research on cover crops went way down because in addition to covering the ground, a legume provides that nitrogen that was so important. Um, so keeping the ground covered year round it would be my number one recommendation. Number two, you do want to try to reduce tillage as much as possible. And you also want to put in as many uh, forms of organic matter as you can while also balancing nit nutrient inputs. That, that gets a little more complicated. And I, I probably won't get into it too much more now, but cover, keeping the ground covered year round is the best. It's probably number one. Yeah. And, you know, it's funny, as you mentioned that in nature, we tend not to see bare or naked soil. Uh, the students may have seen that in the Minecraft world, because if you do have bare soil uh, over time, you'll see things like grass kind of take it over uh, or plants kind of grow over it. And it does get a sort of overgrowth. Um, so that actually, again, is one of those things that sort of translates well uh, in, in mm -hmm. this context. Not everything always does, but it does. That's great. Well, we had a question here in the chat from someone wondering about, should I be submitting videos of my world that I'm making? And so I think this is a perfect time, Eric, if you wanna jump on over to the NACEF website and show Absolutely. what the next challenge will be and help people figure out where to find that. That sounds good, so let's do that. Uh, I did mention that map that we were talking about earlier is on there and that's just down at the bottom of the page. Uh, but if we do head to nasef.org, and I'll, I always start from the main page, and we go to learn at the top, you'll see NASEF Farmcraft 2022. And if you're looking to submit your entries for these preseason challenges, or any of the challenges, really, this is where you'll find all of that information, including registering your team, which it's not too late to do. So if you're still interested in participating, if you haven't started yet, uh, by all means, uh, talk to your teacher, talk to a parent, talk to uh, any adult that wants to sponsor your team and get them to register you to participate. Uh, but we can uh, submit our videos down below. So we want to talk about our preseason challenge three because that is the video we'd be submitting right now. Um, and it is all about uh, the things we've been discussing uh, today, which is uh, things like our soil health uh, and how that contributes to things like sustainability, um, how water usage affects those things, um, and how what kind of impacts these have on local ecosystems. And from what we learned today, ecosystems big or ecosystems very, very small like a handful of soil. So uh, 
protecting our environment and living things that share our ecosystems and habitats uh, is a challenge that can be difficult to balance with the production of food for large populations of people. And of course, we've learned that also includes things like, uh, you know, uh, uh, microorganisms. Uh, how is your local ecosystem being affected by farming? How can resources be used to best feed people while also protecting living things and their habitats? Uh, design a Minecraft world that addresses these issues and provides some ideas as to what can be done to take on these challenges. So there are some questions to consider. Uh, why is water conservation important, uh, important? And how is water used on a farm? How can that water be used more sustainable? What is soil health? Uh, and what are some practices we learned a lot today uh, that can improve soil health? And how do crop rotation and biodiversity contribute to soil health? How and why are pesticides used in agriculture and are there alternatives? So what you're going to do is you're going to create a Minecraft world that addresses some of these. Um, and then you're going to take us on a tour, as you saw in some of the videos early on uh, from our teams in France and Portugal. Uh, you're going to take us on a tour through it and explain what you've done and how you've tried to manage some of these issues while explaining some of the issues that you've researched. Uh, when you're ready to submit, you will, and I will kind of pause my camera over this side of the stream over here for a second. Um, and you'll click add a response. And again, you are you should have be able to log in and join that Flipgrid. Uh, my mic is gonna spike there just for a little bit as I switch over. Uh, and you're going to record. Again, you don't have to record here in the video. If you scroll down, there are some tools. And if you click on options, one of those tools is to record your screen. And you can actually record screen while also notice I'm capturing my microphone. And you can create your entire video and your tour right in here. Uh, or you can choose, if you go back, as some teams done, to edit your video elsewhere and then, of course, upload it. Uh, do be mindful there is a time limit on the videos, and you want to make sure that even if you're uploading a clip, it is not longer than that time limit or it does kind of just stop abruptly. It does get caught yeah. off. Also, you know what? Um, check that there is video of your farm. I think someone just recorded voice. Uh, this week. Yeah, we do get some entries sometimes where it's just voice or it's just this camera and we're not seeing your Minecraft world. So you want to make sure that you're hitting record screen. And in fact, if I do this and I choose the screen where I know my Minecraft game is and I'll hit share and I'll switch back, uh, I can record right here uh, in this world and I can make and I can I can edit and I can do whatever I'm going to do to share what we've shared today about soil health. And maybe I want to include these little signs and here are some examples of covered soil and naked soil and some notes that Kathy put in our world, which is great. Uh, and I'm ready to submit. So I will stop that sharing. And you can not hear it because my screen is not, but my video is already going. And what Kathy was saying was make sure to watch this before you hit submit so that you know that we're going to get the video that you've created. If you right. don't see and video Eric, here, let's make sure to that. Not um, yeah. The sound, because I was struggling to hear some of the videos that were submitted today. Yeah, so check you your can, microphone your, levels. Yeah, check your microphone. We don't so much so want to hear your yeah. Minecraft world as we want to hear you. Yeah, so I think sometimes check your microphone do, levels. maybe they're being considerate in class because you know how some how loud it. Can oh, that is true. Good We've point. definitely had some good some point. entries where we can hear all of the students around you doing their video <laughs> at the same time. So maybe oh. we are just being very considerate. That's a possibility. But if that's yeah. the case, maybe find a quiet spot with your device somewhere uh, where you can project a little bit better. If that's the case. Uh, but otherwise, we loved what we've seen so far, and we can't mm -hmm. wait to see more. We're excited to see how you take on Challenge 3 and tell us a little bit about uh, what we can do uh, to protect our environment, to maintain soil health, to conserve water uh, on the farms that you're creating. I also want to add a little thank you for um, everyone who's just really keeping their screen focused and not using their mouse to point around. Oh, yeah, that's, saving that's Kathy's me. favorite. Right. So <laughs> something favorite. we talked about long ago, right, is that we would, and this is, you've all done a really good job so far, is that Fantastic. when you are recording, be a good camera person, right? Uh, kind of panning and slowly showing us things is great taking your mouse over here and saying, we want to talk about this sign. And so we're going to circle it like this and take a look at what's on this sign. Uh, we, that's really hard to see when you do that. <laughs> so don't do that as much. Excellent. Well, I am super excited, as I know you are, to see what the students are going to come up with for us for this, um, this next round of preseason challenges. So the guide is on that NASA Farmcraft page in the upper right hand side. And I've dropped the link in the chat a few times. So hopefully regardless of when you joined us, you're able to access that. 
and head on over and sign up. I'll reiterate what Eric said. It is not too late to sign up. And also we haven't mentioned prizes yet, but we have some awesome prizes here, including uh, gift cards and Brian and his team for anyone who participates, they are making some custom skins. So anyone who joins us in Farmcraft is gonna get some custom skins that they'll be able to use in their Minecraft world. Forever, fact, we can right? show some of those prizes if you if you throw my screen back up right okay, now. I've got it right on the it. site, uh, and Look you can check you. out some of those. All prizes. right, all right. Let's see here. There it is. There we go. We need to all zoom right. in a little bit. There we go. Whoa! There we go. All Whoa. right. Ooh, hundreds of dollars. Exactly. Oh, that's oh, awesome. dollars. It's exciting. Ooh. That's exciting. For so, your team. For your team. For your team. Right. Exactly. Good point. All right, so we look forward to having you all submit. We can't wait to share some more videos next time around. Michelle, thank you so much for joining us yeah. today and sharing your wisdom. Who knew? I can tell we have barely scratched the tip of the iceberg <clears throat> as far as knowledge about soil, but we certainly appreciate your time and mm -hmm. uh, what you've shared with us. And we will see you all again very soon. Bye. Thanks, Take care, everyone. Bye.